This video is sponsored by Magellan TV. Operation Chariot has been considered the most significant raid in British military history. The amphibious attack had little chance of success. Still, the British commandos assigned to the mission were confident in their abilities. The objective was to destroy the heavily defended dry dock of Saint Nazaire in northern France. 600 commandos, accompanied by a modified World War I destroyer, the HMS Campbelltown that resembled a German vessel, made their way to the dock with a secret meticulously hidden from German eyes. 215 raiders would be captured, and the mission seemed like a failure. But little did the Germans know that the HMS Campbelltown was stuffed with tons of explosives. Time to go off only several hours later. Just days before the San Nazaire raid, the Germans ordered the construction of the Atlantic Wall, resulting in a little-known supergun standoff across the English Channel. Learn more about how Germany and Britain faced off with some of World War II's largest weapons in the Magellan TV documentary Superguns of World War II. Watch today and see how some of the biggest guns of World War II turned the strait into what ships called Hellfire Corner. Visit try.magellantv.com slash darkdocs or click the link in the description below to get a free one-month trial of Magellan TV. Magellan TV is also offering a buy one get one free annual gift card, and purchasing a gift card any time of the year will also give you an additional month of Magellan TV for free, even if you're already a member. Now is the perfect time to share Magellan TV with your friends and family. Visit try.magellantv.com slash darkdocs today and click the banner to take advantage of this limited offer for Dark Docs viewers. Ever since the German battleship Tirpitz left port for the first time in 1942, the Royal Navy and the Royal Air Force began creating plans to sink her. If they didn't, their naval blockade in the Baltic would be useless. Even Churchill said, quote, the whole strategy of the war turns at this period on this ship. The Admiralty concluded from the Battle of Denmark that the only non-German port able to accommodate the Tirpitz for repairs would be the French port of Saint-Nazaire, which was created for the Normandy, a giant passenger ship from the 30s. Saint-Nazaire dock was of strategic importance to the Kriegsmarine for two reasons. First, the port was able to provide shelter for U-boats. Most of these silent hunters of the Atlantic that frequently sent tons of Allied supplies to the bottom of the ocean were repaired at Saint-Nazaire. Second, as the British estimated, the only dock outside of Germany able to accommodate the tier pits was Saint-Nazaire. As long as the small coastal city remained in Axis control, the tier pits was safe from crossing the English Channel, searching for a German dock that could repair it. If the British could destroy the dock, the tier pits, alongside the U-boats, would stop sinking U.S. convoys sent to England, ensuring the commercial route's safety. If they succeeded, the Kriegsmarine would lose its foothold in France, retreating to the Baltic Sea, where their blockade would make sure they no longer threatened operations in the Atlantic. With that in mind, Combined Operations Headquarters began planning the operation. The first idea was a bombing raid. Royal Air Force bombers could target the locations of bunkers, AA artillery, barracks, and other objectives. But the option was ditched due to the strong defensive position of German anti-aircraft guns and the possibility of killing civilians in the area. The French allies would not consent to that. The second idea was a naval operation, which favored the Royal Navy for their superior number of ships. But this too was dismissed, because the Loire estuary was just five kilometers from the Saint-Nazaire port. Any ship with the required range to hit precisely would need to get close, and the estuary would impede its movement. Only letter vessels, with inferior firepower, could carry the attack. The third option was to conduct an airborne operation. It could have worked, but it was rejected for the enormous amount of explosives the soldiers would have to carry to destroy the dock gates. 
final and most desperate option was using a commando force of no more than 600 men. They would infiltrate the dock by force with a destroyer full of timed explosives. It was suicidal, reckless, almost impossible, but no more ideas were on the table. This plan required two specially lightened destroyers to carry out the raid. The first would be secretly stuffed with hidden bombs and rammed under the dock gates. Commandos on board would then use demolition charges to destroy key objectives. The explosives on the destroyer would be timed to explode once the commandos were evacuated by a second ship. When presented to the Admiralty, the op was refused. It was risky and expensive. With the Germans still capable of winning the sea fight, the Royal Navy could not afford to lose two destroyers. Besides, the odds of survival for the commandos were minimal. The path that led to the estuary's mouth was surrounded by concrete bunkers full of MG-42 emplacements and artillery. If they did manage to break in, the breakout would be extremely risky for the British commandos would have to follow the same route out to make it back to safety. By then, the Germans would be fully aware of their presence. Nonetheless, given the circumstances, the mission was approved on March 3rd, 1942, under the codename Operation Chariot, evoking the image of a Trojan horse. The raid's purpose was to destroy all of the following. The Normandy dock, the old gates into Saint-Nazaire, the water pumping machinery, and any U-boats or vessels in the area. In the final revised combined operations plan, the first destroyer's objective was to ram the two dock gates and make its way to the harbor, where it would detonate with the explosives. The other vessel was the escape route for the commandos. Twelve motor launches, mostly unarmored, but equipped with Lewis machine guns and Ehrlichon 20mm guns, were assigned to transport the commandos to their various targets. The other four motor launches accompanied them. They would distract the German MG emplacements with their torpedoes. The support group was composed of the HMS Tyndale and HMS Atherstone. A motor torpedo boat would be used to destroy the external dock gates. If they were open at the moment of the raid, it would have to target the inner gates. The destroyer selected to house the explosives was the HMS Campbelltown, an old vessel from the Great War that belonged to the U.S. Navy. To ensure that the Campbelltown could get over the sea banks and the estuary, some modifications were necessary. It was stripped of all its internal components to lighten it and raise its draft. Additionally, its antique armament, composed of 300mm guns and depth charges, were replaced by a forward gun with a light, quick-firing 12-pounder and eight 20mm Ehrlichens. Extra armor plates were added to the bridge, wheelhouse, and the sides of the ship. To make the old ship resemble a German destroyer, two of the funnels were removed, and the two that remained were cut at an angle. The 5.5 tons of explosives were placed on the ship's bow. Pencil fuses were set on time delays once the commandos had left the harbor. In case the Germans noticed what was going on inside the ship, and tried to tow it out of port. The commandos would open the seacock valves to flood the vessel before leaving. The commander of the operation was Lieutenant Colonel Charles Newman. He decided to divide the commandos into three groups. Led by Captain Hodgson, groups one and two would make the assault on board the motor launches, with the third group defending the Campbelltown. On March 26, 1942, the raiding force was ready to abandon Falmouth Harbor. Before leaving, Vice Admiral Louis Mountbatten, Chief of Combined Operations, said to Newman and the Commandos, quote, I'm confident that you can get in and do the job, but we cannot hold out much hope of you getting out again. Even if you are all lost, the results of the operation will have been worth it. For that reason, I want to tell you to tell all the men who have family responsibilities, or who think they should stand down for any reason, that they are free to do so. Nobody will think any worse of them. None of the men backed out. They were ready to embrace death. A 
accompanied by the HMS Atherstone, Tyndale, and the motor launches, the Campbelltown made its way to San Nazaire. At night, they hoisted German flags. The crew of the ship wore Navy apparel to deceive any German aircraft or U-boats nearby. At 2300 hours on March 27th, the raiding fleet spotted San Nazaire in the dark horizon, and five RAF squadrons initiated a diversionary bombing run. They had instructions only to drop a few bombs at a time to prevent any French casualties. This peculiarity was noted by the German defenders, who were put on alert for a possible airborne assault. Simultaneously, as the RAF launched the false raid, Lieutenant Tibbet set the fuses of the Campbelltown. The charges would go off between 5 and 9 a.m. The small fleet was halted at 1.22 a.m., and searchlights from both sides of the dock signaled the Campbelltown to stop. A British signal officer disguised in a German uniform replied. He used a stolen code from a captured signal book. After a moment of tension, they advanced through the dock. Minutes later, hell broke loose. The Germans identified the commandos and began shooting directly at the destroyer. The attack had begun. Trying to avoid as much fire as possible, some English soldiers managed to hit some searchlights to hide the hidden commandos, making their way to their objectives. With fire coming at them from all sides and blinded by other searchlights, the Trojan horse made its way to the inner dock. As the ship rammed into the dock, Group 3 of the commandos stormed the shore, sprinting to their objectives. The commandos from Groups 1 and 2 did the same. After some fierce resistance, the pumping station, fuel storage tanks, and gun emplacements were destroyed. At 2.30 a.m., when the objectives were accomplished, the three commando groups reunited at the Old Mole's rendezvous point. Only then did they realize how grim a situation they were facing. Most of the motor launches had been destroyed by the German fire. Newman, keeping the morale up, told his men, quote, Well, chaps, we've missed the boat. We'll just have to walk home. They had to fight their way out on foot. Newman told them they could make it by linking up with French resistance fighters and crossing the border to neutral Spain. When the fighting was over, the remaining commandos were rounded up and interrogated. They thought the Germans must have defused the charge because the HMS Campbelltown trap, one of their main objectives, had not exploded. It was past 7 a.m., and nothing had happened. Sam Beatty, one of the surviving commandos, was being interrogated by German officers that were telling him that their attack had ended in failure. Suddenly, the HMS Campbelltown went up, taking out more than 60 German soldiers inspecting the ship. The commando grinned and told one of the officers, quote, We're not quite as foolish as you think. The entire operation saw 169 casualties, 215 soldiers captured as POWs, and only 228 soldiers returned to Britain. Their sacrifice was not in vain. The port of San Nazaire would remain inoperable until 1949, three years after the war had ended. <laughs>